wanted to highlight one of the things that we are The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports and Cox Communications, connecting Virginians to their government. And we're very pleased to connect you this morning with Senator Tommy Norman. Good to see you, sir. Good morning, Woody. It's good to be back with you on a nice chilly day, but you'll bring some warmth into it, I'm sure. And you too, sir. Thank you for being here. Tell us a little bit about uh, New Kent, King and Queen Counties. What's going on there? And uh, talk to us about the uh, constituents you represent. Well, as a result of the redistricting that took place a couple of years ago, uh, my Democratic friends gave me the opportunity to make a lot of new friends. And I've really appreciated that opportunity. They served me. Uh, the district that I now have the privilege of representing runs almost from the North Carolina line, just a little south of Suffolk almost to the Richmond city limits. Uh, so there are a lot of new individuals in between and I've really enjoyed getting uh, to know the citizens of King and Queen and King William and the town of West Point. I had represented uh, New Kent County for a number of years so I had a lot of friends and individuals I knew there. Uh, I have a very diverse district uh, you, from the rural area of King and Queen and King William into downtown Hampton the only reason I, I mention that is they're, they're very different communities. Mm -hmm. Their priorities are somewhat different. Of course, everybody's interested in schools and public safety, uh, but there, there are some conflicting interests that come up at times, and, and that makes it really, really challenging. Uh, in King and Queen uh, and King William, obviously much more rural counties, uh, they are concerned about things like Sunday hunting that I understand passed the House of Delegates overwhelmingly yesterday. I expect that will pass the Senate because it's come out before. Um, Sunday hunting is not such a big issue in downtown city of, of, of Hampton. Uh, so I've, I've enjoyed it. It's a very diverse uh, district and I uh, try my best to reach out and and to represent them well. It does get a little bit more challenging when you go from approximately five jurisdictions to 11 or 12 jurisdictions. Uh, just sheer time and uh, geographical distance makes it a little challenging on occasions. So this particular geographical area is considered part of the Middle Peninsula? It's flirting with the Middle Peninsula. Uh, of course, I do represent Gloucester, uh, which is part of the Middle Peninsula before you get up into the Northern Neck area. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how they categorize uh, King William and King and Queen. I, I, I think that, that they uh, believe they're independent sovereigns, and so that's a good thing. Uh, a lot of history there. I, I recall reading something about a Civil War battle, the Battle of Walkerton in 1864 that was won by the Confederates in one of those two counties. I can't recall which one. Uh, well, uh, you're quite a student of, of history. I'm not uh, all that familiar with the Battle of Walkerton. I know that there is a Walkerton Dam area up there where the, the name came from, and uh, that was probably one of the, the few battles that the Confederates were winning at that point as they were backing up to try to defend the, uh, the city of Richmond. A lot of hunting and fishing. You, you talked about uh, Sunday hunting, uh, boating. Uh, water sports, nature trails, and things of that nature in, in this geographic area. Well, there really is, and uh, the citizens take great pride in the fact that they have a, a rural community. Uh, there are quite a few uh, farms in that area uh, producing a, a diversity of crops. Uh, you've got the Mattapanai um, River that's, that's running through there and the Pamunkey River. Um, I was just up there uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on a nice chilly afternoon uh, duck hunting and 
uh, we had a little luck duck hunting, but just being out in the marshes uh, and watching the sunset uh, was absolutely glorious. Uh, so it really is a very tranquil and, and special area. And the citizens uh, of King and Queen and King William really want to protect that quality of life. Many of them have moved there for a reason, and that reason is that they don't want to live in a conventional, su conventional subdivision, and they want to enjoy some of the amenities of being in a more rural and uh, not developed area. And how has the area fared economically over the last five or six years? I think they they are, are doing fairly well uh, because they are an agricultural and rural based community. Um, probably have not been hit as hard as some of the uh, other areas that are highly dependent upon uh, government and government employees. Uh, there's a Purina plant that is up there that employs uh, a, a few folks, uh, but th they've done all right. Um, their tax base is not as diversified as, as some other communities, but they've been doing pretty well. They have good leadership on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, they are fiscally responsible. It's a smaller community, so they can be more sensitive to the citizens. As, as I recall, maybe in King and Queen, there's 6,400 people. So um, I'm envious of them at time. I represent roughly 300,000 people right now. And trying to make contact and communicate with them, even in this day of electronic communications, can be a real challenge sometimes. Now, I, I take it you are still the Senate Republican leader, although uh, someone suggested yesterday during the floor debate that there are no rules in the Senate now. Well, I won't say that it's been uh, relegated to complete chaos uh, by any means. Uh, we had quite a spirited day yesterday. Um, I think one of the comments I made on the floor, which I honestly believe, is that I view politics as a business. Uh, it's not a sport to me. It's not personal. Um, and the reality is that when we have 20 Democratic senators and 20 Republican senators, uh, the lieutenant governor's position is critical. Uh, the lieutenant governor presides as the president of the Senate, just like the vice president of the United States does of the U U.S. Senate. And when we have a tie vote, uh, on most situations, the lieutenant governor can cast that tie vote. Uh, we enjoyed uh, having uh, Bill Bowling as a lieutenant governor for the past two years, and there's no question that he frequently cast a deciding vote that was favorable to the Republicans. Ralph Northam, a uh, Democrat, is now the president of the Senate, and there's an expectation that he, he will be fair and reasonable, but there also is an expectation that he will cast uh, tie-breaking votes that uh, the Democratic caucus uh, supports. Uh, so it's not personal with, with me whatsoever. Uh, there are always shifts in the political process. Uh, the legislative process in the Senate will move on. Yes, there may be a few bruised egos. Mine doesn't happen to be one of them. Uh, I continue to try and develop a consensus amongst our 20 Republican senators. And frankly, developing that consensus just amongst the Republican senators is more challenging than directing the floor of the Senate. Now, as I understand it, the, uh, the tie vote has a couple of exceptions, the, uh, the biggest one being on the budget. Is that correct? That is correct. Under uh, under our constitutional structure, the lieutenant governor is precluded from casting a tie-breaking vote on certain pieces of legislation. Uh, the most important is clearly the budget. You may recall in 2012, which seems like an eternity ago, uh, that was the last year that we adopted a two-year budget. Uh, we had quite a, a standoff in 2012. Uh, my Democratic friends were less than enthralled about the way the Republicans restructured the Senate on committee assignments. <clears throat> so for 58 days, they voted no on every version of the budget that, that came forward. Um, without being unkind, I characterize that as being obstructionist. And I say that, and I said it on the floor yesterday, uh, that the Republicans will not be obstructionist even though there's been a shift in the lieutenant governor's position, even though he can't vote on the budget. Um, in 2012, 
uh, my Democratic friends did not offer one budget amendment. They never told us until the 58th day of a 60-day session what changes they wanted in a budget. Um, I would encourage our, our 20 Republican senators to not replicate that. That was not flattering. Uh, so we'll move forward and construct a budget. Obviously, there'll be a, con a lot of discussion and uh, debate and consternation over it. Uh, Medicaid expansion. That's something that uh, Republicans are not uh, uh, absolutely against. It's just that w the Republicans are more financially cautious about it, where uh, Governor McAuliffe has drawn a line in the sand and thrown down the gauntlet and said, I will not sign any budget in Virginia that doesn't include Medicaid expansion. Um, I thought that was a very interesting comment before he was even sworn in. Now, what about this, <coughs> excuse me, new authority of uh, the Rules Committee uh, chair to uh, take it upon himself to decide whether an amendment from the House uh, is, is, uh, is substantial? I, that took up quite a bit of debate yesterday, did it not? Well, it did take, a quite a bit of, take up quite a bit of debate. Uh, it was a long afternoon for me. Uh, uh, when I walked on the floor of the Senate, uh, I had not seen a copy of the proposed rules changes, nor had I seen a copy of the proposed committee assignments. And I say that only because when we started the debate about the rules, uh, somehow it came on my shoulders to try to question that, and I had never seen them. And, and so I, I felt a, a little inadequate at times because I was absolutely doing this on the fly reading the rules, trying to think of reasonable discussion points, uh, and then trying to, to articulate it. Um, I know a lot about the rules of the Senate of Virginia. When I was a freshman senator, uh, the most distinguished figure in the Senate was a gentleman from Hampton by the name of Hunter B. Andrews. And Senator Andrews took me under his wing. He was a Democrat, by the way, and a dear friend of mine, and frankly, a, a gentleman that I uh, have modestly tried to emulate. Uh, he took me under his wing and said, Tommy, you need to understand the rules. And, and I know him very well. Um, and I think if there was anything that did disturb me yesterday, uh, it was not the shift in committees. It, it was not the shift in who has the extra vote. It was that rule. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, First of all, my Democratic friends did not have any idea what the implications of that rule were. I understood what they were trying to do, uh, but they had no idea. Um, and I pointed that out. Um, one of the things Senator Andrews told me is do not empower any individual legislator with excessive power. Do not give one legislator too much authority. And to take a chairman of a committee and say when a Senate bill goes to the House of Delegates and they amend that bill and it comes back, it will not go to the floor of the Senate. In 23 years, that has never happened. And what will happen now is the House will amend the Senate bill and send it back and the rules chairman will unilaterally and individually without regard to the other 39 of us be able to decide the fate of that bill. That is not a good policy decision. What was really disturbing is uh, my Democratic friends had not considered that that would even include a budget. So you were going to take a budget and refer it to one man who up until today has not even sat on the finance committee, has had no engagement in the budget whatsoever, and he's going to be able to decide the fate of it. Well, as soon as we pointed that out to my Democratic colleagues on the Senate, I mean, they were panicked. And I couldn't resist the opportunity to use that uh, as, a, as an example and a, a lesson to say, you do not know what you are doing here. This is not about Republicans. It's not about Democrats. That you are degrading the institution of the Senate by empowering one individual. And do not give me don't try to comfort me by saying, well, if that person makes a wrong decision, we'll just remove him. Very little comfort in that. It also puts that person in an extremely difficult position as well. Well, it does. And, and, I, and, and that is a very, very fair observation, Woody. Uh, 
I've been involved in uh, the debate and evolution of legislation dealing with the deregulation and re-regulation of electricity for many, many years. Um, and there's a lot of diversity uh, of opinion out there about mm -hmm. that. And, and the gentleman uh, who's going to be chairing that rules committee is out in the APCO service area. And that has been a particularly challenging area because their rates uh, have been uh, high. Uh, and people out there in uh, southwest and south side Virginia have been very upset about this. Um, and we as elected representatives have to be sensitive to what our constituents are saying. One is we, we want to try to represent them as well as we can. But secondly, a lot of us like to get reelected. And all of a sudden, you're put on the point on something like a deregulation of electricity bill uh, that's favorable to APCO and your citizens start raising cane with you, that's a tough, tough position to be in. It's what's good policy or what's good politics. And that decision could very much impact your reelection opportunities if that's what you're focused on. Now, I know the committee chairmanships have changed. What about your committee assignments, per se? Uh, I remain on the committees that I have served on for a number of years. Uh, my Democratic friends were gracious in that they uh, did not uh, give me the opportunity to learn about new committees. I, and I'm appreciative of that. I, I really am. Um, there's some areas over 23 years that I've developed a degree of knowledge about. I didn't say expertise, I said a degree of knowledge about. Um, and I've worked very hard in the area of, of public safety and courts. And in the last few years, I've started to learn a little bit about the budget. So I'm very appreciative that they did not introduce me to some new committees and new realms of, uh, of, of government. Uh, I noticed uh, your closing remarks yesterday uh, drew upon your experience and training as, as a lawyer. You're, you're known as one of the more renowned lawyers throughout the, the Commonwealth. And your ability after a trial, for example, to go over and, and share a sarsaparilla at the bar <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with, with your opponent. And I take it uh, <clears throat> your philosophy encompasses maybe something that someone said years ago. There are no permanent enemies. There are no permanent friends, just permanent interest. I, that's a very fair uh, quote. Uh, it really is a very fair quote. Uh, I see lots of legislators up here that become personally invested in their bills. I see legislators that become personally invested uh, in a debate and they take the exchanges in a debate very personally. Uh, and I think that's just, uh, I, I don't do that because I think it's just been my training uh, as an attorney. Uh, I'm used to being, I've been a litigator my entire career. As I say, sometimes not so good, but I've been a litigator my entire career. And, and you cannot be an effective litigator in the practice of law if you take things personally. Uh, you start taking things personally, first of all, it clouds your judgment. It minimizes your objectivity. And it just interferes with the energy that you ought to be focusing on the issue at hand. And particularly, if you, if you take that same thought and carry it into a, a legislative process where it's just not just one lawyer against another lawyer, in this arena, you've got Republicans against Democrats, you've got liberals against conservatives, you've got fiscal conservatives against more aggressive spending things, uh, spending. There's just a whole variety of opportunities. And, and you absolutely could eat yourself up by taking these issues personally. So I just look at it as a business. I try to make it as a business decision. Uh, you win some, you lose some, and that's the way it is, and accept the decision and move on. I, I just don't have the capacity to gnaw on a bone for a long time. I mean, uh, what happened yesterday is done. That is the reality of it. Um, and as I said yesterday, those people that were my friends before uh, the debate yesterday are still my friends as long as I am their friend. Now, you, t you touched on Medicaid. Uh, another issue uh, in health care relates to a tragedy suffered by one of your colleagues recently, uh, and that relates to the need to address mental health uh, again uh, that's been on the agenda for a number of years. Uh, Virginia Tech seems eons ago, but there have been studies relating to 
the need to provide more resources. Now there are bills dealing with the need to potentially detain against their will someone who may be a danger to himself or others. Talk to us about that issue. Well, let me start with, I think, something that really needs to, to be said. Uh, I cannot imagine the personal anguish and sense of tragedy that Senator Creed Deeds has experienced. Uh, I am so incredibly proud of his willingness to come forward after that heartbreaking experience and advocate publicly on behalf of mental health. Uh, even the tragic loss, uh, he could have re become something of a recluse and not been willing to get out in front on it as he is trying to heal not just his body but his heart. Uh, I saw him uh, on 60 Minutes on a Sunday night and he was on Anderson Cooper the other night and just his personal courage and commitment to advocating on mental health. Uh, I, I congratulated him on what I thought just had to be a very challenging time for him on 60 Minutes and, and he said, you know, Tommy, I just can't allow for Gus to have lost his life without something coming out. And it, it is so it is so discouraging that it takes something of a tragic nature like that to bring a focus on any issue. Uh, a legislative body, by definition, is reactive. And I understand that. Uh, we reacted uh, significantly after the Virginia Tech tragedy. Uh, we revised a lot of the laws. We tried to put more money towards mental health. But mental health is like a lot of issues. Uh, it has an insatiable appetite for money to address the issues. And I don't mean that in an unkind way. It's just there are so many variables and unpredictable issues in the area of mental health, whether it's diagnosis, pre-screening, detention, beds available in facilities, treatment, aftercare, medication administration. Um, and we reacted on uh, to the Virginia Tech situation. No, we never thought we had done a comprehensive reform of mental health. What we thought then was that we had made a significant incremental step towards improving the process and revising the laws. As a result of the Deeds tragedy, uh, some new issues have come to mind. The availability of beds, whether we ought to have a central database that someone can go to immediately and see where there is an available psychiatric bed uh, in that geographical area where a, a patient can be committed. Uh, the whole issue of how long we're going to detain a person uh, before, by law, we have to release them, whether they've been diagnosed or not. Th these are real issues, but the Deeds tragedy has encouraged the legislature to focus on different areas than we did back with the Virginia Tech situation. I expect, uh, as a result of Creed Deeds' advocacy, the empathy that we all feel for him and his family and the identified need of improving some areas of detention and the availability of beds that you will see some significant money put in that area. Now we also have the continuing implementation of a Department of Justice settlement regarding uh, inst institutionalization of those who can't take care of themselves, uh, primarily adults now who have lived their lives, for example, in our training centers who have elderly parents who need a place for them to reside. And I know there's a, 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 the settlement basically uh, requires the state over a period of time to find more community-based residences for those individuals. Uh, a lot of those parents are, are still upset. I don't know if you've heard from any of them, but tell us where that is now. Uh, I have not heard from many of them, but I'm sure as a result of this program, I will. And that's okay. I, I mean, that's fine. Um, yeah. When you first come to the General Assembly, you, it, you would be what I would refer to in the practice law as a general practitioner. I mean, you're looking in every area, education, mental health, public safety, uh, health and human resources. After you serve for a number of years, you begin to narrow down your focus. You cannot be a master of all trades. Um, and so the reason I say that I haven't focused on mental health a great deal is that over the years, 
I have focused on public safety issues. Um, I've, in the recent years, I've been focusing on the budget a great deal. I'm a fierce advocate of public education, K through 12, and, and higher education. Those are the areas that, that I focus on. And I have respected that people like Emmett Hanger from mm -hmm. uh, over in Augusta County focus on the mental health issues. Uh, what we have to do is we have to create uh, a, an organization where in a division of labor amongst the legislators where certain individuals develop certain expertise in, in specific areas and mental health has not been one that I have focused on. Um, but I'm obviously aware of the decision. I will never forget uh, a number of years ago uh, we were having a public hearing for a budget before we went into session. And this lady came in, I, and she had uh, an intellectually disabled child who was in, uh, in his 30s, as I recall. And this woman tearfully said, I wake up every morning and I pray that my son will die before I do because I don't know what would happen to him if I was not alive. And let me tell you, that just, that just wrenches your heart beyond belief. I mean, I'm a, a, a father of, of two daughters, and... I just can't imagine saying that. Um, you know, I think most of us who are parents, um, you know, we literally lay down our lives for for our children, and to hear a mother say that is is just one of those resounding images that I have never forgotten. And we do need to find more community-based services. We need to find more residential settings because there is a population out there um, of uh, of people who are are aging, but their parents are a lot older, and you have to ask yourself, what do you do with do with these people who are incapable of taking care of themselves? And, and we must do something in Virginia. Uh, that constituency deserves better. In our remaining two minutes, uh, we need to discuss... Uh, You've been talking a lot, Woody. <laughs> <laughs> ethics reform, and yes, I know sir. you had a number of bills that have now been consolidated over on the Senate side, and of course, this all is as, is as a result of... Uh, uh, the unfortunate circumstances that resulted in the indictment of the previous governor and his wife. Talk to us about where those issues stand. Well, first of all, I know we have a short period of time. Uh, my heart and prayers continue to go out to the McDonald family, and uh, I'm proud to say Governor McDonald has been a friend of mine for 30 years, and and uh, I just share in in the sorrow and the grief at what's happened. Uh, I have the um, I have the comprehensive or the omnibus ethics reform package. It has multiple elements to it. Uh, I've been working with my Republican friends and my Democratic friends, and many of their issues on both sides of the aisle have been rolled into this one piece of legislation. Uh, we're continuing to to work on it. it uh, it has a, 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 a ethics commission that can provide advisory advice and review forms. We've changed reporting requirements. We're putting caps on uh, how much an individual gift can be. It, it's very comprehensive, and it will continue to evolve, Woody. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Senator Tommy Norman. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications, connecting Virginians to their government. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.